Yeah, whatever. Close enough. Oh, wait. How did we say we were going to start? I don't know. You told me. A clap? <laughs> oh, yeah. Big annoying hello. We... Hello! We welcome back. Hey, guys. Welcome back to the channel. <laughs> Yo, guys. What's up? Welcome to the Science Department YouTube channel. Today, we're talking about inclined planes, specifically tension. If you haven't already, don't forget to like and subscribe. By the way, it cannot hear you. Um, so what? if you <laughs> if you ask a question, it doesn't pick it up. So I might do that annoying thing where I repeat your questions. Is that annoying? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. I don't know. Okay. Um, now, tension. You probably all have a bit of a sense for it. Um, just to refocus us a little bit. Uh, we have come from just talking about inclined planes and focusing on the normal force and how it plays a role when we start looking at an inclined plane. Um, today we're going to be looking at tension, and we're not specifically going to focus too much on tension on inclined planes. We're just going to make sure we're very clear about what tension is like in the general sort of sense. And then we know now how to apply that to inclined planes in terms of breaking that into component parts that are parallel and perpendicular to that plane, okay? So if we did have a plane, we could easily take a tension force that was vertical and we could take the component parts of that parallel and perpendicular to the plane to see how it would behave. Yes, Alex. Because we are going to extend it into talking about inclined planes and how tension acts. But as I just said, really, it's, it's nothing new. But, but we're still doing the inclined planes topic. Um, now, with this can get this can get all levels, Brandon, Hannah, this can get all levels of deep and complicated, right? When you actually talk about what tension is, generally we think of the tension in a rope, but really if I pull on either end of my water bottle, the reason it doesn't fall apart is because of the tension inside it, right? At some sort of level you could start talking about the atomic bonds and things like that that make things solid, okay? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, obviously, yeah, for sure. Um, and we're not going to go too deep with that. In fact, for a lot of problems, we're entirely going to disregard tension, okay? So let's quickly look at this free body diagram and we'll talk about some key things. We're going to have our object. We're going to give it a mass. So let's call this mass one. It's a trapezoid, that sort of classic shape. Here's mass one. And it's hanging from a rope. What's that, sorry? Is it just a weight? It's just, yeah. No, it's just a weight today. This is... Yeah, it's from the uh, Bugs Bunnies. No, the Roadrunner jokes. Acme. Okay. Now, on the other end of this... Look, just some arbitrary object, we're not going to focus on it. It could be tied to the end of a crane or a hook or whatever. Some solid object where essentially what's holding that up is a normal force, okay? Tied to the ceiling or something like that. We don't really care about what's going on at this end, all right? Um, what we do care about, though, and we've been asked to do so in this, uh, in this question, we've been asked to show the tension forces. Now, you'll notice, Hannah that there is a plural on forces. So, Toby, reflect for a moment where the forces of tension are going to be found. Have a think, where could I set or draw forces of tension acting in this example here? This would be a rope, yep, I can sort of, does that make it look more or less like a rope? Either that or a candy cane. Okay. All right, enough criticism of my artistic ability. What do we think? In the rope. What it, yeah, it's quite long, though. What am I just drawing force like this? That's not how we draw... That's not how we draw forces in a free body diagram. Alex? So what you've identified is this, the force due to gravity, the weight pulling it down. The normal force acting here, or applied force, or whatever we decided to call it, yeah. 
yeah, sort of pulling on either ends of that rope. But how do we now draw tensional forces in that rope on a free body diagram? If we wanted to depict the direction and the points of origin of tensional forces in that rope, what would we do? Anyone want to have a guess? And this is an intentionally tricky question. I want you to think about it. There's lots of answers you could give. Um, only one that becomes the convention we'll use. Two arrows either end. So an arrow here going what? Down. Oh, so like this, and an arrow there, and an arrow there? Yeah? Interesting. If we had this situation, right, quite a lot of force acting upwards, quite a lot of force acting downwards, what are we saying about at the middle of this rope? Not breaking, but what would be happening at the center there? The forces would be pretty strong opposing either way. Um, this is arguably a correct answer, but it's not the answer we're going to go with. So what else have we got? Another common tr uh, attempt to sol solve this is to actually imagine the rope as individual pieces, to split it up into lots of individual pieces and imagine the forces acting within each of those pieces and how they're pulling on each piece. Like I said, we can get a bit carried away and get quite complicated. Here's what we'll do. This is the convention we're going to use. We're going to imagine this as an object where forces are acting the rope is acting against this normal force, pulling down on that object. So that object there, which this whole situation is stationary, that object is stationary due to a tensional force acting down on that object, in this case, the roof or whatever, against the normal force, all right? Then down here, we have another object and the tension will act against that as well. How does that look to people? Right, FT is equal, and I've chosen to use FT again because they are equal. This is not FT1 and FT2, and they're different. They are always equal. The tensional forces in the rope are always equal. But they're not always equal to the other forces happening there. And we'll get into that a bit later. But um, I don't want you to develop an association now that this force of tension must be equal to that force of gravity. The relationship can be a bit more complicated than that due to different masses on different objects involved in our system. Now, the reality is, like I said, these forces often don't matter. If we treat this whole thing as a system, the normal force will be equal and opposite to the gravitational force producing perfect uh, zero net force, no acceleration, uh, stationary or technically stationary, uh, it could also be constant velocity, right? It could be moving at a constant velocity. Non-accelerating is really what we mean as the general case. Um, but all we need to know is the gravitational force and the normal force to establish that this system has no acceleration to it, right? And the tensional forces really don't matter. Now, in individual masses, we can, of course, calculate the tensional forces. Um, even if there is an acceleration, we can use our net force equals mass over acceleration and calculate any acceleration or any tensional forces. Um, but when there's two masses, things get a little bit trickier, and we'll look at that later. So we'll move on for now. Does anyone have any questions about that part? No? Mm -hmm. So right now, this mass has a gravitational force. And then there's a rope tied to the ceiling, and that ceiling obviously would have some sort of, really, I mean, you could probably think of that as a tensional force if you wanted as well, but we're going to imagine it as a normal force. It's just this perfect opposing force. It's not going to break, nothing to worry about there. Okay, so the roof is pulling up, the mass, the weight from gravity is pulling down, and we have forces acting within that rope which we can try and understand really deeply, but we don't need to. All we need to know is what those outside forces are doing to our system. Yeah? Yeah, so we, we actually don't need to calculate tension forces very often. Um, and again, really, I could ask you to calculate the tension forces within this bottle when I pull on either end, right? It's a solid object. There's some tensional force acting there. When I pull on this end, the bottle has to have a tensional force resisting that pull, 
And then when I pull on that end, the bottle has to have a tensional force resistant that pull, and collectively we get no acceleration, right? But without tension, this bottle would just rip apart at the two ends that I'm pulling on. So that's the idea, okay? But that's not a useful thing to consider. It's more useful to consider an object joining multiple objects. All right, let's do an example where we are accelerating, just to show that we can calculate a tensional force uh, even when we are accelerating. So example two for me in your books. All right, here's our image for this one. Now, you'll notice a change in convention here, okay? I've immediately drawn a diagram slightly different. And like I said, generally the convention will be to have uh, something attached to this or whatever. But in this case, I'm just going to skip that sort of step and imagine that the rope itself is pulling up. Um, really, this, this vector here is this, this vector here. And I'm just ignoring what's happening up at the top of this crane or pulley system or whatever's going on up the top there. I'm ignoring this component here entirely, and we're just looking at this, okay? Um, and I've just drawn it above the rope uh, for, oh no, that won't let me rub that out now. Um, I'm drawing it above the rope for the simplicity of not having um, an arrow within an object like that, which I, I don't like to draw. Uh, nothing wrong with this as a convention either in this case, but it's important to note that it's not the general convention, which is two separate parts to this to this um, this problem. Okay, let's get started. So, uh, have a little bit of a brainstorm. Let's first identify what we're looking for in this problem. What are we looking for? Give it to me in notation, the correct notation. Give it to me as the notation, FT. All right, find FT, that's what we're looking for, for sure. We want to find force of tension, okay? Uh, what do we know? Let's list out our knowns. We know that acceleration is equal to 0 0.4 meters per second squared. We know that mass is equal to 2 kilograms. Is there anything else we know? Gravity, yep, don't forget. Gravity is equal to... Now, again, we've got to make our choices about our negatives here. Let's set gravity to be a negative uh, acceleration. Excellent. So um, whether you identify this now or not depends on how many times you've done this problem, probably. If you get to this point after a bit of practice, you'll probably go, all right, knowing FG is going to be useful here. FG will equal mass times the acceleration due to gravity. Now, if you don't immediately go to that when you look at this list of known values, okay, if you don't immediately go, oh, it's going to be useful to know that force of gravity, I want you then to figure out how we're going to find FT and you'll see that you'll need force of gravity, okay? I don't mind which order you do it in, but let's do it the second way now, um, just so that we see what happens if you don't think to immediately go and calculate FG. How are we going to actually find FT? Who can tell me what, what 
concept of physics is going to allow us, or what formula of physics is going to allow us to actually calculate a tensional force? Here's a question. Is it um, equal in magnitude to the force of gravity? Why not? Because we're accelerating. What rule is it, what formula is it that tells us that? Good old Newton. Second law, Newton's second law, what is it? In your formula in data book, you should be able to identify it. It's got something to do with forces and accelerations. Right, F net, F total, sum of all forces, whatever you want to do, equals what? What you're reading is circular motion formula. Now, we're getting complicated, what? MA, F equals MA. Sum of all forces equals mass times acceleration, yeah? Really important critical formula. You shouldn't need to go to a formula in data book for this. You should know this, okay? This should be memorized. F net equals MA. That's what's going to help us figure this out. And if we break down F net, what is F net? It's FG plus FT. And that will equal our mass times our acceleration, right? Now, we want to find FT. So if we rearrange, we get FT equals mass times acceleration minus FG. We know mass, we know acceleration, we want FG. Okay, so don't be scared to work these problems backwards from your solution. You should be able to identify what you're actually going to do to find your final answer and then go, oh, I need to figure this out. And then you come back to here, okay? And you go FG just equals mass times acceleration, acceleration due to gravity in this case. So we just get two times 9.8, negative 9.8, as we have established our acceleration due to gravity is negative, our acceleration due to this net force is positive. That makes perfect sense. Um, that's going to be 19, good old 19.6, negative 19.6. And in this case, that negative is going to be valuable. Yeah, what does it tell me? Okay, it, it speaks to our system of direction. We have a positive up and a positive right. In this case, our force of gravity is negative and that makes perfect sense because our force is acting downwards. Now, that means we need to go to our force of tension here and we need to calculate our mass, which is just two times by acceleration, which is 0 0.4. And we need to subtract, sorry about my poor laying out of my problem here. Try and squeeze it onto one line if you can, please. We need to subtract our force of gravity. What is our force of gravity? Does the negative matter here? Yes, absolutely. If you don't use the negative value here, you will get the correct answer because you'll end up actually subtracting from your force of tension. You'll end up with a negative force of tension most likely. Um, so subtracting negative 19.6, and we're going to end up with 0 0.8, 20.4. Yep, that sounds about right. Cool, 20.4 newtons. And if you pause for a moment and think about that, we're pulling up with 20.4 newtons, gravity's pulling down with 19.6 newtons. Yeah, we're gonna accelerate pretty slowly upwards. Cool? All right, finish copying that down. If you have any questions about any of those steps or any of that math, please ask. Otherwise, we'll go on to our next example in a moment. Is everyone okay if I move on? Yeah. Cool, let's do it. Example, oh, what are we up to, three? Pulleys. Now, pulleys fall into the same sort of topic as, as tension because anytime you have a pulley, it's usually a rope or a string or a chain or something running over that pulley, a cable, right? 
Um, so tension and pulleys tend to go hand in hand. Now all pulleys generally do is change the amount of force. Now you can use multiple pulleys to actually increase the force. You can double forces, triple forces, half forces by using multiple pulley systems. We won't look at that at all. All we're ever going to do with pulleys is pulleys. Change direction of forces. That's it. Sorry? Yeah, so they can increase and decrease forces. We won't look at that in our syllabus. It's not assessed. We will just be looking at how it can change the direction of forces. Um, so what I'm talking about here is if I have an object, rests on a cliff, the edge of a hole. How about that? Sounds enticing. Ooh. Of a hole. A deep hole. An object rests on the edge of a hole with a weight hanging over the hole. using a pulley. And we're going to do, in this example, we're going to do, uh, it's all stationary. <clears throat> Find force of friction. Find the friction force. Um, this is actually kind of a cool, and I've been trying to find it for ages. I'm sure Bear Grylls did this once, where he built, um, it's called a surface area anchor. So basically, you get a large, wide object, and you weigh it down a little bit, and then you can use that as an anchor to, like, rappel down a cliff. I'm sure he did it with, like, a parachute or something on some episode of Bear, uh, Man vs. Wild or whatever. But I cannot for the life of me find it. Um, but basically, what you do is you take... You take a mass, we'll call it M1, you use some force of tension, and some force of friction, and a rope over some sort of pulley to hold up a mass, which of course has some force of tension and some force due to gravity. And hopefully, you don't fall to your death at the bottom. Ah! Deep, dangerous hole. Okay? There's spikes, yeah. What, what, what? Uh, the bone. They made a bone. Yeah, they're not wooden or metal, they're made of bone. Okay. Uh, some elephant as well. There's some quite large... Anyway. Uh, we know that the second mass is equal to 35 kilograms. And we are trying to do what? Uh, this given in the question. That's me giving it to you now. Yeah. Oh, and we know that the first mass is um, 20 kilograms. Yeah. And what are we trying to do? Find F, F. Okay. Now let's pause. Let, I'm going to let you get your notes down. We're, this will take a fair bit of working out, so leave some space underneath, of course. Um, <clears throat> make sure uh, you get this down nice and neat with a bit of space underneath, and then we'll go through it and have a bit of a talk about everything that's going on here.
Good question. What do you think? What's your intuition tell you? You think that force of gravity is coming from the mass of object one? So yeah, try and imagine each isolated system first and what would be the forces acting for each of them. What do you think is happening to the gravitational force on M1? This is not an inclined plane, to be clear. This is a flat plane. So what's happening to the force of gravity acting on object one? Right, it's being absolutely cancelled out by the normal force of this cliff. Assuming the cliff has the sort of structural rigidity to not collapse. <clears throat> okay, let's start talking through this. So, we can see here the role that the pulley is playing, all right? This tensional force here and this tensional force here are acting equally and opposite. Now, one of the complications with this is you have to think of it as if this was exactly like the previous problem where you're either all up and down or all left and right. Because if you try to do positive and positive like this, you can make mistakes. All we need to imagine is this is a one dimensional problem, okay? It doesn't matter that this is gravity and that's friction, we just need to imagine it like this. It's just this situation. Because then what we imagine is we imagine this force of friction acting opposite to the force of gravity. So if gravity is negative, what's your frictional force going to be? Positive. Your frictional force has to be acting positively for the math to work out that you cancel the force of gravity with the frictional force. Okay? We have to appreciate that the frictional force here is not negative and the gravity is negative. They are equal and opposite in this case. They are acting in opposition to each other. So this is the challenge with pulleys. They shift how this whole system works. This is no longer correct. If I had a negative out there and I then labeled my force of friction negative, I would get the wrong answers. Okay? So be warned, pulleys are there to annoy you when it comes to having a good system for positive and negative directions, right? And again, that's physics, right? We need to actually be able to problem solve and think through this problem and actually understand what's happening. Now, the way I want you to imagine this problem is one big solid object like this. There's a force of gravity. There's a force against gravity, which in this case happens to be friction, but that's irrelevant. And there's a mass here. It's no different. It's absolutely no different to that exact scenario. If the two masses were just glued to each other and one was being pulled up and the other was being you know, weighed down, that's all that's happening here. Except for one complication, which we established before. The force of gravity does not affect mass one. It only affects mass two. Okay? Right? So here's how we approach this problem. Um, we want to find the force of friction. We need to establish then um, that force of friction is going to be equal and opposite to the force of gravity. We do not need to calculate the tensional forces. Okay, So FF is going to be equal to the negative of FG. We need to recognize that just from this discussion that we've just had about really what we're describing here. Exactly. Yeah. If there was motion, then the forces would not be balanced. They would not be equal. And then you would have to go to, just like we did in the last example, you would have to go to your net forces and add them together and look at that little difference in your forces. And that would be your, your net force, right? Um, so if FF was slightly greater, you would do the exact same thing we did before. Don't copy this down. I'll just show you what that would look like. We would have to do F net equals... M A F of friction minus F of gravity equals, and this is where it gets messy, M1 plus M2. 
you're talking about the motion of the whole system, the acceleration of the whole system times by acceleration. So you have to add the masses. Um, however, the force due to gravity does not consider both masses. The gravitational force is purely coming from mass too. That's where it gets messy. Now, thankfully in this problem, we don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. That will come up. And the, one of the biggest, um, messiest problems on the past externals, I believe, was very similar to this, except on an incline. So you had to look at the perpendicular and parallel components of a gravitational force here to calculate the frictional force required to prevent this object from falling down. It's, we'll, it's probably something we'll do in external revision at the end of year 12. But it is, it is as far as this goes. Um, so let's, let's go back to this, right? So we've established that there's no acceleration here, right? Acceleration equals zero. Therefore, force of friction is just equal to the opposite and equal of the force of gravity. Fg equals m2 times by gravity. The actual working out here is not hard. 35 times by negative 9.8. Uh, that's going to equal negative, say again, thank you, negative 343. Three. Let's pause and think about our negatives here. Uh, we're going to say that force of friction is equal to the negative of that negative. Does that make sense? So our force of friction, FF is equal to negative, negative 343. Three which is going to give us a what? A positive, does that make sense? Should friction be positive in this case? Yes and no. <laughs> no, if we set that, you know, that sort of triangle, if we did this, then technically that should be negative, right? Um, but no, it is positive in this case because it's acting in opposition to gravity. So mathematically, it makes perfect sense that we've got a positive frictional force. It acts opposite to gravity, which was a negative force. Okay. Is that all right? So the actual working out for this problem is, is not super, super big. And now we're really starting to get into some physics problems where the physics understanding comes out and the math is not the challenging part. So please make sure you have the physics understanding and ask if you don't. Is anything freaking anyone out about that? Notice how we totally ignored the tension, yeah? Doesn't play a role. Take your time, make sure your example's making sense, digest that, ask any questions. Nothing? What? We're good? Huh? No questions about that one? Nah. There's got to be some, just whether or not you know how to ask them. Um, one thing that could be worth mentioning here is if this is stationary, then the tensional forces are all equal, all forces are equal. If this is accelerating, the tension force is not equal to any of the other forces. It's just the tension forces are equal to each other. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give you one last little thing. I don't even know that it's worth going through an actual example. I'll just point something out. Uh, and then I'm going to give you guys your exercise. But we'll take a brain break before we get into the exercise. But I just want to talk about this very quickly. Um, applied forces at an angle. Again, this is hopefully pretty obvious by this point and not going to give you guys any challenges. Uh, uh, there we go. This box is pulled at an angle. An angle.
Sorry if that's a bit small, guys. Acceleration in the y direction is zero. Therefore, fg equals fn plus fay. Not my neatest work. So really, this is the important um, thing to recognize from this whole scenario, the idea that in these cases, <clears throat> gravitational force will be equal to the normal force plus the actual uh, y component of our applied force. Obviously, as well, you can do this with uh, if there was a frictional force acting against the horizontal component of our applied force um, such that the box was stationary in the horizontal direction, we could then also set them to be equal and calculate that. Um, but yeah, that idea of that net force and one of those net forces or one of the components of that net force is the vertical component of your uh, Y applied force. Is that okay? Is there any real concerns about that? Yeah, yeah. So that gravitational force, right? Normally the normal force would be equal and opposite to the gravitational force. But if you pull upwards on a box, you actually effectively reduce the normal force. So if I pull lightly upwards on this bottle right now, right, I'm applying a force upwards such that the normal force that has to be applied by the desk is less. There's less force being applied on the bottle by the desk because I'm applying some force upwards. I mean, think about it if the bottle was on a set of scales, right? And then I start lifting upwards. Um, but what this is saying is if we pull diagonally, we have to imagine those X, Y components. And again, if we pull diagonally and we're on an inclined plane, we have to imagine X, Y components and or parallel and perpendicular components, depending on which frame of reference we're looking at. Okay. If we're looking at whether the object's moving along the plane, then we're going to break it down into perpendicular and parallel components to the plane. Cool. Take a brain break. I'll chuck your exercise up, and uh, we'll get stuck into it. Um, I am also going to be uh, giving you guys a pop quiz in two minutes. And if you fail the pop quiz, I check your homework. Sound fun? I don't know. It's a good question. I appear to have broken the cable somehow. <laughs> which may have severely affected the recording. Or it may not have. What's happened? We good? No, it's freaking out. <laughs> Half a second, that's all you get. Good. Uh, this is Check Your Learning 2.2 from your textbook. Please only do, don't worry about question one. Bit of a waste of your time. Do question six, seven, eight, nine. Is that it? Into six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> six. Oh, I didn't snip the right part. Hang on.
Go. Question six, seven, eight, nine. Don't worry about. Uh, and ten. Yeah. <laughs> 